Shabbat Shalom and Hatzameya. So here we are, seven weeks, 49 days, one more to the count of Shavuot. So uh, I have a message today that's called Ruth and the Kinsman Redeemer. Ruth and the Kinsman Redeemer. And if we look at the book of Ruth, the book of Ruth is very similar to the Song of Solomon. Uh, in the sense it's a parallel to the bridegroom Yeshua and his bride and, and in one way even more the Song of Solomon is an awesome book there's a lot of uh, little mystery things there and uh, analogies that you see but I, I think it's even much more clearer in the book of Ruth of the bride and the bridegroom but the two of them together really it's very interesting when you put the two together and Yeshua and his bride, the first fruits. Ruth is the bride. Boaz is the kinsman redeemer, the bridegroom, as we're going to see. And <clears throat> also, uh, the book of Ruth is about our calling. Because remember, it's the same time period we're in now. It's the time period from the Feast of First Fruit, which starts the uh, day after Sabbath during Passover week until the time we're now to Shavuot, which is tomorrow. So it's about our calling Passover, signifying our baptism, right? And the seven-week count to Shavuot is the harvest we're supposed to be doing in bearing fruit for the kingdom. And that's why there's seven sevens. It's showing our whole life as a believer. From baptism during Passover, and seven sevens showing the complete cycle in our life as a believer. And then Shavuot and the giving of the rock Holy Spirit, and also the signifying of Shavuot, of us changing from a uh, mortal human being to a glorified spirit being at Yeshua, the bridegroom's return. The seven week count shows completeness of our calling and preparing to be the bride of Messiah. That's what we're going to see today. So let's start. Let's start in the book of Ruth. And Ruth 1, 1 and 2, it says, It happened in the days that the judges judged. There was a famine in the land. And a man from Bethlehem, Judah, went to live in the fields of Moab, and his wife and his two sons. So this is during the time of the judges. That's important to understand when we're understanding who Ruth is. Uh, the name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi. The name of his two sons were Malone and Chilion. Ephrathites from Bethlehem, Judah. And they came into the plains of Moab and remained there. They're in the plains of Moab. So uh, I, throughout time... Many people, especially Christian people, think that Ruth is a Gentile <clears throat> coming uh, from Moab. When actually, when you look at this, and this is why you have to understand during the time of the judges with certain things, because in the time of the judges, judges at times were even called Elohim. And only we see that in the book of Ruth, the judges being called Elohim, and uh, in the time of the judges at that point, meaning mighty ones, you know, not meaning uh, some kind of deity, but a mighty one. But we see that they came from the plains of Moab. That's where Ruth is from. So the plains of Moab is not the land of Moab. It's the land that was taken over by Moab, and then it was overtaken by the Israelites, by the tribe of Reuben. So Ruth is actually a Reubenite. She's not a Gentile. I have a whole sermon on this online. It's not my purpose today, but I do want to mention it, that we understand it, that Ruth is indicative of the lost tribes of Israel uh, you know, being grafted into Judah, the kinsman redeemer, it's not about a Gentile being grafted in. Although Gentiles are grafted into the covenant just as well as anybody else. It's not against Gentiles whatsoever. So, a matter of fact, if we go to the book of Joshua, Yeshua, or Yehoshua, the son of Nun, 13 and verse 32. Uh, before this, I'm not going to read all of the accounts, but he tells the, the land of Reuben and the land of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh. And then in verse 32, it says, These are they whom Moses caused to inherit in the plains of Moab, beyond the Jordan, opposite Jericho, eastward. So, in the plains of Moab is the land of Reuben. It's right across. As a matter of fact, it's exactly where Mount Nebo is, which was the land of, of uh, Reuben that's over there, across from Jericho. But without a doubt, Ruth is from the tribe of Reuben. She's an Israelite. So let's continue now in the story. Uh, I'm not going to read everything, but I'll be reading a lot from the book of Ruth today. So what happens? Her husband dies, and then the two sons die. And Naomi is really, really grieved, right? She's really, really grieved. And she tells the two daughter-in-laws, because they're still young, you know, 
don't stay with me. You're, you, you, you stay with me and you got nothing to look forward to. So she says, basically, go back to your tribe, you know, and look for another husband there, right? And uh, that's what uh, she told them to do. But the one uh, daughter does go and the other one, Ruth, decides not to. So let's look what Ruth says here, starting in verse 11. And Naomi said, turn back, my daughters. Why should you go with me? Are they your sons in me, in my belly, that sh should be husbands for you? Turn back, my daughters. Go, for I am too old to belong to a husband. Though I should say there is hope for me, and I should be tonight with a husband, and also should bear sons, will you wait for them, that they might grow up? Will you shut yourselves up for them, not to belong to a husband? No, my daughters, for it is much more bitter for me than for you, for the hand of Yahweh has gone out against me. So here she is. She's getting older in years now. Her husband's dead. Her children are dead. She has no grandchildren to bring her name on. And she's saying, even if I was married and was going to have a child tomorrow, you know, are you going to wait 20 years till that child grows up? So she's telling them to leave. She's looking at it. And this is what uh, it happens then. Verse 14. And they lifted up their voice and wept again. And Orpha kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. So the one sister goes, and she said, See, your sister-in-law has turned back to her tribe. She's turned back to her tribe, to the tribe of Reuben, and to her Elohim. You know, that could mean uh, Yahweh, or it could mean the judges. That's what I'm saying. They, uh, that she turned to the tribe and the judges. In that time, there was no king of Israel, and there were judges that were judging over the tribes of Israel. So she's going back, and they were really separated, right? So it wasn't... It, although Israel was one country, during the time of the judges, it wasn't so united. As we even see, even when the king started, right? When the king started with Saul, we see that uh, Judah is separated and goes to David after Saul dies. And then the other ones are over here with Saul until David was really the one to unite the kingdom together. And Ruth said, do not beg me to leave you, to turn back from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people are my people, your Elohim, my Elohim. I'm not going to go to the scriptures that we have it in our Bible, but if you look at 2 Kings 3 7 and 1 Kings 22 4, it's exactly the same wording that the kings of Judah and the kings of Israel say to each other when they ask, Help me in war. And he says, Of course I'll help. Your people are my people, your Elohim is my Elohim. So it's it's not that she's leaving the false deities of Moab, she's leaving her tribe and she's leaving everything of her inheritance there because she has no inheritance in Judah. And like I said, today, we, don't, we live in a different world where people don't have the same inheritance and you don't get from your parents and grandparents and great-grandparents what was there. But in the days of the Bible and in the coming days, that's the way it is. The land inherited to the tribes is forever. So it's a big thing for her in loyalty to her mother-in-law, and love for her mother-in-law, to leave behind her literal, especially as a woman, right? Especially as a woman. She says, where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May Yahweh do to me, and more so, if anything but death part you and me. So this is really showing the great commitment that Ruth had to her mother-in-law, right? And to her dead husband also, right? that she was there and it's showing her loyalty. And when you're looking at this now from the standpoint of Ruth being us, being the bride of Messiah, and as we're gonna see Boaz being Yeshua, the, the kinsman redeemer, the, the bridegroom, Naomi is picturing the mother, right? Naomi is the mother, she's like the congregation. She's the one that nurtures the bride. But the commitment, this is the commitment we all should be making at baptism. And that's really what we should be learning from here. That at baptism, it's not a matter of just saying, oh yeah, I want my sins forgiven, and I'm going to accept uh, you know, Yeshua in my heart. No, this is at baptism what is required of each of us to say everything else we had is gone. You know, Yeshua said, unless you put, if you put father, mother, sister, brother, husband, wife, anything before me, child, you're not worthy of me, right? And this is what's showing for Ruth. This is where each of us should be at baptism. She's indicative of the bride. We should all be doing this at baptism. We should be clinging to the bridegroom and clinging to the congregation and understanding our life has changed from this point. 
So this is really an important scripture. It shows this is the commitment we should be making. And then in verse 19, it's very interesting, a couple of verses over, it says, And they went, both of them, until they came into Bethlehem, and it happened as they came into Bethlehem, all the city was moved at them, and they said, Is this Naomi? So again, who comes from Bethlehem? Micah 5, 2, right? The Messiah comes from Bethlehem. And you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, being least among the thousands of Judah, out of you he shall come forth to me to become one ruling in Israel, and his goings forth have been from old, from the days of eternity. So we see that the Messiah has no beginning and no end, and he's coming from Bethlehem. So that's why I said that a little more where the book, the Song of Solomon is the most explicit book in all of the Bible showing the love of Yeshua to his congregation. There, there's nowhere that you see that more explicitly stated in, in, in Song of Solomon. But here in the book of Ruth, it's just so plain. The examples are so plain if you understand who the characters are. If you understand of Naomi uh, representing the, the mother, the, the congregation, the nurturer, and you understand Ruth is the bride, and you understand Boaz, and even being called the kinsman redeemer, you don't even see examples in scripture really of anyone being a kinsman redeemer. You see what it means, as we're going to see in Leviticus. You see what he does. But Boaz being literally being called their kinsman redeemer, it's the book of Ruth. Once you understand who, who the players are, it's really an amazing book. And really also a shadow of what we're supposed to be doing here. And all about Shavuot, right? Because like I said, Passover is about baptism. It's about uh, our death to the old life. But then we have these seven weeks where we're supposed to be growing. And why are we counting? We have to count. It's the only holy day you have to count every day because you don't know exactly when it is. It's, it's not on a certain day. You have to count from a certain day to that holy day because that's supposed to be our life. Our life is not is supposed to be one where we're diligently always thinking about our calling. That we're not just after baptism, that's it. No, you have to think about it every single thing. So we see, he mentions Bethlehem, Bethlehem, the house of bread, right? Yeshua is the bread of life. And it's all about, they're going to Bethlehem to find the kinsman and redeem it, because that's where the Messiah comes from. He comes from Bethlehem. Then in verse 22, of chapter 1, and Naomi returned in Ruth the Mo Moabitess, her daughter-in-law with her, who returned from the fields of Moab, again, right? The fields of Moab, or the plains of Moab. They're returning now from the land of Reuben, and they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. So this is all happening, right? The story starts when the Feast of First Fruit, it's starting at Passover, and the beginning of that count to Shavuot, and we're going to go through the whole seven weeks now of this harvest until the day of Shavuot. So it's starting at the harvest, the barley harvest, the grain harvest, the feast of first fruit. Leviticus 23, 9 through 11, and then I'll drop to verse 14. And Yahweh spoke to Moses saying, Speak to the sons of Israel, and you shall say to them, When you come into the land which I am giving to you, and have reaped its harvest, and have brought in the omer, or the beginning of your harvest, to the priest, then you shall wave the omer before Yahweh for your acceptance. On the morrow, the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. Drop down to verse 14. And you shall not eat bread, nor roasted grain, nor fresh ears until the same day. So any of it, these are the different phases that the barley is in, and you're not to eat any of it until you have brought the offering of your Elohim. It's a never-ending statue throughout your generations and all your dwellings. Right? Why? Because... Until the first fruit is holy and accepted, then the first fruits can't be holy and accepted. So what is it saying, right? Until Yeshua went up and was accepted by the Father for his sacrifice, then none of us can be accepted. Where do we see that? We see that also in John 20 and verse 17, after the resurrection, right? Where Yeshua is just resurrected, Mary, Mary and Magdalene is coming early on the first day of the week, early Sunday morning, he's already resurrected. And what does he say to her in verse 17 of John 20? Yeshua said to her, Do not touch me, for I have not yet ascended to my father. But go tell my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father, my Elohim and your Elohim. Right? What did Ruth say? 
Your Elohim is my Elohim. My Elohim is your Elohim, right? And this is what's happening here. By, by Yeshua going and being accepted by the Father, now we become children. There's no other way that we could become children except he first paid the penalty of our sins. So we see that now in, in the story of Ruth here. This is when it's starting. It's starting at that time on the Feast of First Fruit, you know, and Yeshua being accepted as the wave sheaf, right? By his acceptance, acceptance, then we can be accepted. The wave sheaf pictures Yeshua being accepted by Yahweh, and until he is accepted, no one can be accepted. So now let's continue. Uh, Ruth 2, uh, chapter 2 and verse 1. And Naomi had a kinsman of her husband, right? A mighty man of the family of Malimelech, and his name was Boaz. And like I said, the most important uh, job, I think, in all of the Bible is the kinsman redeemer. And yet there's so little, almost like Mal Malchizedek, Melchizedek, you know, the king of righteousness. There's only a little bit said here and here that you have to put together. But it's the same with the kinsman redeemer. Because when you understand what the kinsman redeemer represents, you understand who Yeshua is, and you understand when he has to come, that he must come before the Jubilee, because that's when the kinsman redeemer redeems back to the people. So Leviticus 25 and 25, who, because what is this kinsman she's talking about? We have a kinsman. Leviticus 25, 25 says, if your brother has become poor and has sold his property, then his kinsman redeemer shall come, and he shall redeem the thing sold by his brother. And when does he redeem it? He redeems it in the Jubilee, right? So it's the same way. I'm not going to go over all of Leviticus 25 now. I've done it in other sermons. But when you're selling land, you really never sell the land. You're selling harvests. So let's say that, uh, you know, there's, you're in the 32nd year of the Jubilee because the Jubilee is every 50 years. When you sell the land, that means you only sell it for 18 years because in the Jubilee, the land always goes back to the original owner. So that's what's happening here now. When she's saying there's a kinsman of my husband, what is she saying? She's saying there's someone to redeem us. So they're showing that they're coming from a loss, right? They're coming from death of the husbands. They lost their land. They have nothing left. And what are they looking for? They're looking for the kinsman redeemer in the Jubilee to redeem them. He's the one that's going to redeem them. The re and the kinsman is redeeming those who lost. And whether it's lost property, it's whether you became a slave, he's redeeming in that year, the year of Jubilee, he redeems all things that are lost. So let's go now to uh, verse 8. Verse 8. Because now what happens? They find out that... Uh, Boaz is the kinsman that's there, right? So Naomi, the mother, the nurturer, she sends the bride out where? She sends the bride out to the to Boaz. And she says, don't go in anybody else's field. Go to his field. Why? Because he's the bridegroom. He's going to be the one to protect her. And if she goes in other fields, she's going to be in trouble. So in verse 8, Boaz says to Ruth, do, not, do you not hear, my daughter? Do not go to glean another field, and also do not pass through, and you shall stay close to my young women. So, right, don't leave the camp. There's safety with the flock of Yeshua once you come into the congregation. This is what I'm saying all the time. Don't be surfing the internet to all these false sites. Don't be visiting all these false congregations. There's people that will even go to Sunday congregations, and they're Sabbath keepers. And I'll ask, how on earth can you go to a Sunday congregation when you're... And they say, well, I need, I need friends for my children. You know, my children need fellowship. And it's like, they don't need that kind of fellowship. So very clearly right here, he's saying, don't, don't glean in another field. You glean from the bridegroom. You glean from the safety is in the flock of Yeshua. John 10 in verse 1. John 10 in verse 1. And this is one way we've talked about in the end time, right? There's wheat and there's tares. And Shavuot is a big time to know because a, 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 at Shavuot, it's the end of the wheat harvest. You're seeing all of the fruit that's born. But in the tares, there's, there's, there's nothing. There's no fruit that's born in a tear. So by harvest time, everything's known. Are you bearing fruit or are you not? And it knows if you're wheat and tear. But John 10 says, Truly, truly, I say to you, that he who does not enter into the sheepfold of the flock by the gate, but climbs up in another place, he's a thief and a robber, right? These are the ones that people that they want to come to faith, and then they want to be a leader. They want to be a minister. They want to be, 
and they've never been trained. They want to come through another way. And Yeshua told us, he told us the, the, the qualifications of somebody who's an elder in the congregation. And one is that he's not a new member. And like I said, there's people sometimes that are brand new in the faith, but they can't submit themselves under leadership. So they're coming in another way. But the one entering through the gate is the shepherd of the sheep, right? There's only one shepherd. The doorkeeper opens to him, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leaves them out. And this is, this is a parallel to the ten virgins, right? Five were foolish, five were wise. And the foolish ones are like the Laodiceans. The wise ones are the Philadelphians. And they're the ones that are staying in the sheepfold. They're the ones that are staying close to the congregation, right? And when he puts forth his own sheep, he goes in front of them because the sheep follow him because they know his voice, right? Do you know the voice of the shepherd? But they will not follow a foreigner, never. But they will flee from him because they do not know the voice of strangers, right? So very clearly, you know, that the true sheep follow one voice. They follow one voice because there's only one truth. And if you're out there, you know, always going to the edge of the, of, of the, of the gate, always trying to go past, then you better watch because that's a goat tendency. You know, it's a goat tendency. Always wanting to, to surf a little more on the internet. Always wanting to get a little more from somebody else. That's a goat tendency. The sheep know the voice of the shepherd and they will never follow a stranger. Never. You know, never. They know it. So it's one way to know the sheep from the goats. So back to Ruth now. Okay. Back to Ruth now. So we see the sheep know the voice of the shepherd. They don't wander like the goats. They only evolve follow the voice of the shepherd. And that was Ruth. And like I said, she is a beautiful example of what we need to be. And she never, ever, ever strayed, right? She, she followed the voice of the mother, the congregation, and then she stayed with the bridegroom and followed his voice and never strayed from there. So let's uh, back to chapter 2 of Ruth in verse 10 to verse 12. And she fell on her face and bowed to the earth, and she says to Boaz, Why have I found grace in your eyes, that you should notice me as I am a stranger? And Boaz answered and said to her, It has been fully revealed to me all that you have done with your mother-in-law after the death of your husband. And you left your father and your mother and the land of your birth and came to a people in which you have not known before, right? She gave up her inheritance in her tribe. Because even we know, even the women, remember what happened in Numbers 27, uh, where the women came, where they didn't have, a, a, you know, like a male, and, and what, it, what was the ruling that came out? Well, they should marry a male in their own tribe, and they won't lose their inheritance. She comes out now, a woman by herself, and she's going to another tribe, and she's going to lose her inheritance there. But this is where the bridegroom, the kinsman redeemer, is seeing this, and he's moved by it. Her, her act of loyalty, her act of love, her act, her act of selflessness, right? And that's the way. Are we that way as believers? Is our calling everything about Yeshua, everything about bearing fruit, everything about his kingdom? Or do we have our own life? Because if Ruth, was, if Ruth she's a young woman, if she's thinking about her life and what's best for her, she would have never went with the mother-in-law with Naomi. So he's saying, you know, it's fully revealed to me that you have done with your mother-in-law after the death of your husband. And you left your father and your mother in the land of your birth and came to a people you have not known before. May Yahweh repay your work and your wages shall be complete from Yahweh the Elohim of Israel under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Right? Wow. So her wages will be complete. Why? Because she's working for Yahweh. She's working for the bridegroom. And Yeshua will reward us for our work if we put him first. And it's a great self-sacrifice. There's no doubt about it. But if we believe that in faith and we put him first, he's going to reward us for it. Revelation 22 and verse 12. And behold, I am coming soon. Yeshua is talking now. And my reward is with me to give to each according to his work. Very clearly. So that means we have to bear fruit. We have to have Work. I'm going to talk more about that tomorrow because this is harvest time. So at harvest time, we need to be talking about the fruit that we are bearing. Uh, and then verse 13, look what Ruth says back. And Ruth said, let me find grace in your eyes, my master, because you have comforted me 
and because you have spoken to the heart of your handmaid, and I surely am not as one of your handmaids, Bob. So look at her humility. She's realizing she doesn't deserve this. She's getting grace from the kinsman redeemer. And it's the same way. Do we feel the same way? Like when you look at the Tanakh, the Tanakh is an awesome, great book, right? We read it every day and it shows so many things. It shows Yahweh's plan. And like I say, it shows the Messiah concealed. The Brit Hadashah, the New Testament, is the Messiah revealed. But without the Brit Hadashah, without Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, can we really understand Yeshua as a being, his love for us, what he's doing, his sacrifice? You really can't. You can't. You can, you can look in, in Isaiah 53 and you can understand that it's prophesied he's going to do this and be humble and do these things. But the Brit Hadashah opens it up in a way that you can never imagine. So are we the same way? Are we like Ruth here that we're so humbled at his love for us, of what he's doing for us, and how he is. If we go to Matthew 11, in verse 28, because Yeshua is meek and humble and shows love and grace for his people. Come to me, all those laboring and being burdened, and I will give you rest. Bear my yoke upon you and learn from me that I am tranquil and I am meek, and in my heart you will find tranquility in your souls. For my yoke is pleasant and my burden is light. This is the master we serve. This is our bridegroom. And that's why I say Song of Solomon. There's no book like it that explicitly shows his love for his people and how he feels about his bride who's prepared herself and how excited he is as the bride is preparing to rule with him forever. So the kinsman's yoke is easy and his mercy and his love much, right? Ruth 2 and verse 14 and look, and this is what Boaz says to her. At mealtime, come here, and you shall eat of the bread and dip your morsel in the vinegar, right, the wine. And she sat at the side of the reapers, and she reached out roasted grain to her, and he reached out roasted grain to her, and she ate and was satisfied and had some left over. So what happens? Once they're both making this commitment to each other, and she makes the commitment to him, that says, you're going to be first, I'm going to follow you, I'm going to dedicate and work for you, what happens? You know, it's like the baptism, right? And, 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 and the Passover. So we see this, that there's always, in covenant relationship, there's a memorial meal. And that's why every year it says that Passover is our memorial. So she's eating this memorial, right? And there's bread and there's wine there. It's kind of interesting because the word they use is kind of like a bitter wine. And our life is like that, face it. As a believer, our life is wonderful, it's great, it's fulfilled, we have everything we need, we have Yeshua and everything, but we're still physical human beings. And because we have to be purified, we go through baptism of fire. So we're gonna have trials, and we're gonna have suffering. <coughs> so although every year, we get that great, great blessing of taking those symbols every year and staying in covenant relationship with Him, that's why we take the bitter herbs, because sometimes it is with, with, with bitterness that uh, our calling comes. And it's to all of us. So Matthew 26, 26 through 28, we see the same thing. The memorial we take every year with the bread and the wine, fruit of the vine. Matthew 26, 26. And as they ate, taking the bread and blessing it, Yeshua broke and gave to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And taking the cup and giving thanks... He gave to them, saying, Drink all of it, for this represents my blood of the new covenant, which concerning many is being poured out for remission of sins. Right? So here it is. Same thing that she's doing there. It's, it's a uh, prototype of our yearly memorial meal that we take with the Pesach with Yeshua. Back to Ruth, and chapter 2 and verse 20. So now what happens, you know, she goes back to the mother-in-law and she shares the mother-in-law that she's been with the kinsman redeemer and what's happening there. And look what Naomi says to, to her in verse 20. Naomi says to her daughter-in-law, to Ruth, Blessed is he of Yahweh, who is not forsaking his kindness with the living and with the dead. Right now we're talking the kinsman redeemer is also one of the resurrection. So even the dead will be glorified through the kinsman redeemer. 
He has not forsaken his kindness with the living and with the dead. And Naomi said to her, the man is near of kin to us. He is our kinsman redeemer. He is our kinsman redeemer. So this word indicates the rightful next of kin who would redeem his relative who has fallen into bondage and lost their inheritance and is indicative in scripture of the Messiah who redeems those who seek him of the bondage of the debt of their sins, which according to the Torah would be punished by death. This is why it is very clear the Messiah must return directly before the Jubilee, which is the year of redemption. And we know in Isaiah, we know many other scriptures that talk about this. And we're getting close to that time. So, wow, as we're getting so close to the bridegroom returning, every, every day should be exciting to us. Every Sabbath that pictures the millennium should be exciting to us. Every holy day that pictures the plan of salvation, right? Every Sukkot, which pictures the millennium. But particularly every Shavuot, because Shavuot is about us, right? The two loaves that are made. Feast of First Fruit and Pesach is about Messiah Yeshua, but Shavuot is about the bride. Shavuot is about the two loaves, Judah and, and Ephraim coming together, the bridegroom coming, our change over at Shavuot, you know, into a glorified spirit being. So it's the most exciting holy day, and it's the holy day that Yahweh pours his spirit on his people because it directly has to do with the first fruits of Yahweh. So what a, a great time from this. But this is signifying the resurrection from the kinsmen who will revive the seed of the sons of Naomi through Ruth, Ruth the bride, right? So even the dead are going to be revived through the king, kinsman redeemer. Now, what happens next? So now, just like Song of Solomon, the bride and the bridegroom are there, right? They've made their intentions to each other. You know, it's like the baptism. We make our intention. We go in covenant relationship. Yeshua accepts us. And now what happens? Now the bride has to get ready. Now it's the point. This is the betrothal period that we're in. The bride has to get ready. So in chapter 3, let's start reading here. And her mother-in-law Naomi said to her, My daughter, do I not seek rest for you, that it may be well with you? And now is not Boaz of our kindred, with whose... Young woman, you have been, behold, he is winnowing the threshing floor of barley tonight, right? He's winnowing. He's separating the wheat from the chaff, just like Yeshua is doing today. And you shall bathe and anoint yourself and put your garments on you and go down to the threshing floor, right? The bride has to prepare herself. Do not let yourself be known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking, right? You, it, we're not known until... The, the work is over. Remember the parable of the wheat and the tares? Should we master the, 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 the devil? He's put these tares in there. Should we pull them up? And what does he say? No, don't do it yet. Because you might pull up wheat with the tear. Wait until harvest time, and then he will separate the wheat from the chaff. And it shall be when he lies down, you shall know the place where he lies down, and you shall go in and uncover his feet and lie down. And he will tell you that which you are to do. And she said to her, all that you say, I will do. Right? Ruth is the bride. She's the obedient one. She's the loyal one. She's not questioning. She's not doubting. In faith, she's following. She's following. She knows that Naomi is the mother. She knows she's like the congregation. She's the nurturer. You know, the congregation brings the right doctrine. The congregation, the elders bring, bring the nurturing. They bring the teaching. And the bride is supposed to follow. The bride is supposed to be there, not questioning everything, but following in an appreciation of it. And then the bridegroom shall be ready for the bridegroom. And she went down to the threshing floor and did according to all that her mother-in-law commanded her. And Boaz ate and drank, and his heart felt good. And he went to lie down at the end of the heap. And she came secretly and uncovered his feet and lay down. And it happened in the middle of the night that the man trembled and turned himself. And behold, a woman was lying at his feet. Right? And it reminds you, she's lying at his feet. Do you remember a woman lying at Yeshua's feet? Right? The woman, when she's washing his feet with her hair, remember? I'm not going to go to the uh, scripture now, but when Yeshua is there, right before he's ready to suffer in the last Passover, and Miriam is washing the feet of Yeshua with her hair. And it happened in the middle of the night, and it like, uh, okay, and, and the man trembled and turned himself, and behold, a woman was lying at his feet. Verse 9, and he said, who are you? And she said, I am your handmaid, Ruth, your servant, Ruth, and you shall spread your skirt over your handmaid. 
for you are a kinsman redeemer. You shall spread your skirt. What is she talking about? Well, spreading the skirt over one was symbolic, was the symbolic act of stating that they are under their protection. In a Jewish traditional wedding, the couple is married under a talit with the tassels hanging down on all four sides, showing the woman is coming under the covering of the bridegroom. It would be totally outside judicial order and an act of rebellion for a woman to wear the tassel on her own, as it would show she refuses the covering of her true bridegroom, Yeshua. And it's the same today, right? When we're all collectively part of the bride, male or female doesn't make a difference, we are all part of the bride, Yeshua is the bridegroom. And when a person in the congregation doesn't want to come under the the uh, talit of the elderhood in the congregation that Yeshua put there, when they want to be out on their own, when they want to be doing their own way, what they're showing is they're not in submission. And Ruth, I say, you cannot find a greater story in all the Bible of loyalty, submission, love, and she represents us. She's representing us of someone that never, ever, ever is thinking what's best for her. And that's why Yeshua said, he who tries to save his life will lose it, but he who loses it for my sake will gain eternal life. Our whole life, and this is what faith is, it's trusting him, Yeshua, in all things. It's trusting him that he's there for us. So wow, what an unbelievable story that's happening here, right? And she tells him, spread his skirt over her, spread his skirt. We see this other times in scripture also, right? Uh, 1st let's go to Song of Solomon 8, though, to show the bridegroom preparing herself. So she prepares herself. She comes to the kinsman, the bridegroom, and we see the same thing in Song of Solomon. Song of Solomon 8, verse 5, says, Who is this who comes up from the wilderness leaning on her beloved? Who is this coming up from the wilderness, right? And that's why the bride prepares herself in the wilderness. And I, I, I am so... You can't, I can't tell you how grateful I am that Yahweh allowed us in the wilderness last year. It's changed my life. It's changed my way of thinking, how I think about it. I pray and hope we're allowed to be there this year. We're planning on it. Who knows? There's a lot of places you still can't leave your country. Uh, what's going to happen with travel? But in faith, we're preparing to being there in October. And this very well could be the last time that we're meeting collectively as, as a group for the feast. And uh, it is so important because this is where the bride comes from. This is where the training comes from. The training comes from the wilderness. And without the training, you're not going to be ready. He says, I awakened you under the apple tree. There your mother travailed with you, right? Naomi, the mother, the congregation, the nurturer. There she travailed, she bore you. Set me as a seal on your heart, as a seal on your arm. For love is strong as death. Jealousy is cruel as Sheol. Its flames are flames of fire, a flame of Yah. Many waters cannot quench love, nor will the rivers overflow it. If a man would give all the wealth of his house for love, they surely would despise him. Wow. So we see here that this is the love that the bridegroom has for his bride, right? Because she's prepared herself. She's got herself ready. And then she asks for him to... She asked the bridegroom to cover her with, with his skirt. So let's go to uh, Revelation 19. Revelation 19, 7 through 9. Let us rejoice and let us exalt and we will give glory to him because the marriage of the Lamb came and his wife prepared herself. Praise Yahweh. And it was given to her that she be clothed in fine linen, pure and bright, for the fine linen is the righteousness of of the saints. And he said to me, Right, blessed are the ones having been called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These words of Yahweh are true. Praise Yahweh. What a great scripture, right? Because the bride has made herself ready. And that, that should be our whole focus and purpose now. Should be getting ready for this time. Because we see the parables there. The wedding invitations went out. And who had a field to go to? And who had all this worldly stuff that people were not preparing for this. And now we're getting closer and closer and closer, and still many aren't preparing. Many are, praise Yahweh, but many aren't. And that's the difference of the five wise and the five foolish. That's the difference of the wheat and the tares. That's the difference of the land of the same in, in, in the Philadelphian. 
So we could just go, you know, you can't save somebody else's salvation, but you have to do what you're convicted for yourself. And we see it there. The bride has made herself ready. Revelation 7, 14 and 15. Revelation 7, 14 and 15. Says, and I said to him, sir, you know, because he's asking, who are these people, you know, coming out of this tribulation? Who are these people that are that are clothed in white? And he said, these are those coming out of great affliction, and they washed their robes and whitened them in the blood of the Lamb. Because of this, they are before the throne of Yahweh, and they serve him day and night in his sanctuary. And he's sitting on the throne, will tabernacle over them. Some translations actually put, he will spread his skirt over them. He will tabernacle over them or he will spread his skirt meaningly. He will cover them. Tabernacle means to cover. That he will cover them, meaning he's going to protect them. He will protect them. Uh, Yeshua will tabernacle to literally spread his skirt over his people, his bride, for protection. They will be under his protection forever. One more scripture on this. Ezekiel 16 and verse 8. And this is when Yahweh is telling uh, Judah and Israel of all the sins they did and how and what he did for them. And look what verse 8 of Ezekiel 16 says. It says, And I passed by you, Yahweh is talking, and I looked on you, and behold, your time was the time of love. And I spread my skirt over you and covered your nakedness. And I swore to you and entered into a covenant with you, declares Adonai Yahweh, and you became mine. Right? So putting the skirt over somebody just like the, 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 the hoopah, the talit, when the uh, Jewish person is getting married, it's showing possession. It's showing that the bride is becoming the possession of the bridegroom. And that's what Yahweh says. He literally says that I spread my skirt over you and covered your nakedness. Right? Because where does the nakedness come from? It comes from back in Genesis 3. When Adam and Eve rebelled and they put faith in the serpent instead of faith in Yahweh. They thought Yahweh was a liar. What happens? And they ate the fruit. They became naked. Meaningly, they had no covering. They had no covering. They were on their own. They were going to decide, right? Just like Satan said, you will know good and evil. And he was right in one way. And that's why I say, you know, Satan, he'll always tell you a half truth. Yeah, you'll know good and evil. The only difference is you won't know good from evil. You'll know good and evil, but you won't know good from evil. And in human nature, unfortunately, probably 80, 90% of what you know is going to be evil. And yet you think it's good and when it's evil. But he covered their nakedness. And that's what Yeshua does to us. He's covering the nakedness in our life from our own human nature, our own pride, our own selfishness, our own self-focus. And our focus, especially now, especially now. But you know what? Up until the day he returns, they'll be eating and drinking and marrying, right? That people, up until the day they re he returns, and you'll, you'll shake your head if you're a real believer, why won't the person still repent? Why won't they? They see this coming. They see this sign. They see that sign. They see that sign. Because human nature is selfish. And that's why I say, Ruth is the beautiful story of selflessness, of giving everything of herself to her bridegroom, but yet there's still going to be people that are going to follow Satan unconditionally to say, worry about yourself. Focus on yourself. Do it about yourself. And that's the decision you have to make. Do you want to be the wise or the foolish of the ten virgins? Whatever one. But the Laodicean is naked because he hasn't allowed Yeshua to cover him and tabernacle over him. It's that simple. Back to Ruth now. So what happens? So now let's go to chapter 4. So now the, the kinsman redeemer, the bridegroom, he's going to go and he's going to redeem her. The only thing is there's somebody else there, right, that is a closer kin redeemer. So we're going to see what happens here. And Boaz went up to the gate and sat there, right? Everything happens at the city gate. It's amazing. Today in Israel, I've taken many, many thousands of brethren over there to city gates that are there because that's where the king sits in the city gate. Even in Tel Dan, they found the actual uh, place where the king sits over there and many, many places where we see the, the gate of the city. That's where things are stored. That's where the, the guards watch. That's where transactions take place. But Boaz went up to the gate and sat there. And behold, the near kinsman of whom Boaz had spoken was passing by. And he said, such a one, turn aside, sit down. And he turned aside and sat down. And he took ten men of the elders of the city and said, sit down here. And they sat down. 
And he said to the near kinsmen, Naomi, who has returned from the elders of Moab, will sell a portion of the field which belonged to our brother to Elimelech. And I said I would uncover I would uncover your ear, saying, Buy it before those sitting and before the elders of my people. If you will redeem, redeem. But if you will not redeem, tell me so I may know. For there is no one beside you to redeem, and I after you. And he said, I will redeem it. Right? So first the person thinking, oh, there's a field. Okay, I want it. I want it. Sure. Uh, why not? There's more land. More land for me. Great. And then Bo said, well, in the day you buy the field from my Naomi's hand, even you have bought from Ruth of Moab, the wife of the dead, to raise up the name of him who has died over his inheritance. So she's saying, he's saying to the man of Judah, okay, you can redeem, but then you also have to raise up the seed for the dead. And what does he say? And the near kinsman said, I'm not able to redeem for myself, that I not ruin my own inheritance. You redeem for yourself my right of redemption, for I am not able to redeem. And this is indicative of Judah today, right? Judah has redeemed part of their inheritance in the land of Israel. And here we are, Ephraim. We're waiting in the shadows. We're waiting in diaspora. We're waiting to come home. Has Judah welcomed us? No. No. You know, why haven't they welcomed us? They haven't welcomed us because they're afraid of marring their own inheritance. They're afraid if we let the other tribes back, we might lose what we have. So that's Judah's mindset today, but that's not a good mindset. <laughs> because what happens now? This man just lost his blessing. He just lost his blessing in fear, the same way Judah today is losing a blessing of allowing the other tribes to come back, and in the end, Judah will be punished for it. <coughs> and they're going to go through a lot because it's part of prophecy, and the tribes will come back one way or another. So now what happens? So now the kinsman, the true kinsman, is going to redeem and this formerly was done in Israel for redemption, verse 7. And as for an exchange to confirm every matter, a man would draw off his sandal and gave to his neighbor, and this was the attestation in Israel. And the near kinsman said to Boaz, Buy for yourself, and he drew off his sandal. And Boaz said to the elders, All the people, you are witnesses today, they have bought all that belonged to Elimelech and all that was to Chilion and Mahon. Malone and from the hand of Naomi, right? So he's buying all this knowing, right? Because he doesn't have a, 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 uh, an heir yet. And he knows that his first heir is going to have to build up their inheritance before his own. And you know what this reminds me of? It reminds me a lot of Joseph, the stepfather of Yeshua. Because it's the same situation. He takes Miriam, who's a young woman, in, right? He's older, we know that. And he knows that Miriam is an only child from Heli, her father, and that their first child they have is going to have to redeem through Miriam for Heli before he gets redemption. He's not knowing that that child is Yeshua who's going to redeem all the tribes. And actually the curse that was to Judah, because you see it in Matthew in the genealogy, the curse that came through uh, uh, Jeconiah, and the Matthew genealogy is then broken because that curse was through Joseph, but not through Yeshua. Yeshua breaks the curse because of who he is, because he's, he's Elohim, you know, and the Messiah. So little did Joseph know that by giving up, he really wasn't giving up. And that's the point. You can't outgive Yahweh. The more you give to Yahweh, the more he's going to give back to you. I've seen it in my life a thousand different times. And that's the same thing that Boaz is doing here. Boaz, is, it's like a parallel with Joseph and Miriam, with Boaz and Ruth. Both of them selfless, both of them looking at, at this pure uh, young virgin who's giving up everything for them, an older man, and they're willing to mar their own inheritance because of what that person is doing. So, in verse 10, And also Ruth of Moab, the wife of May. Malone, I have bought for myself for a wife and to raise up the name of him who died over his inheritance. You see, he's not saying to raise up for me. He's saying to raise up for him. And the name of him who died shall not be cut off from among his brothers and from the gates of his place. You are witnesses today. So what's again it's showing? It's showing the kinsman redeemer with resurrection. That the dead are being raised. Their names are being raised. They're not being forgotten. So this is indicative of the resurrection that's there. One more verse, verse 11. And all the people who were in the gate with the elders said, We are witnesses. 
May Yahweh make the woman who is coming into your house to be like Rahel and like Leah, both of whom built the house of Israel. And may you do worthily in Ephrathah and proclaim the name in Bethlehem. Ephrathah means blessing and proclaim the name in Bethlehem. Why? Because that's where the Messiah comes from. The Messiah comes from Bethlehem. So while beautiful story of redemption, how Yeshua purchased our life with his. So the same way Boaz being the kinsman redeemer. <clears throat> Acts 20 and verse 28. Acts 20 and verse 28 says, Then take heed to yourself and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit placed to his overseers to shepherd the congregation of Yahweh, which he purchased through his own blood. Right? So the same way that Yeshua is giving up his inheritance because we're co-inheritors with him for us. The same way that Joseph was giving up his inheritance to Miriam, in Matthew 1, is the same way that Boaz has given up his, his inheritance to the dead husband of Ruth, is the same way Yeshua is sharing his inheritance with us. Talks about that in Hebrews 1 and Hebrews 2. So, beautiful story we see here. Now, what happens? Verse 13, the bridegroom takes the bride. And Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife, and he went into her, and Yahweh gave her conception, and she bore a son, right? She bore seed. She bore, bore fruit. Drop down to verse 14. Because what happens now? Naomi still like the mother, like the congregation. She's going to be the nurturer. And the woman said to Naomi, Blessed be Yahweh who has not left you this day without a kinsman redeemer. And may his name be called in Israel. And may he be to you a restorer of life. And a nourisher of your old age, right? That's what Yeshua is, the kinsman redeemer. He's a restorer of life. He's the master of the resurrection. King of kings and master of masters. And your daughter-in-law who loves you has born him who is better to you than seven sons, right? Seven being the number of completion. Because this is the son that's actually in the lineage to Yeshua of Messiah. And Naomi took the child and laid him in her bosom and she became nurse to him, right? The same way that the congregation, the elders, and the nurturer, they nurture, they nurture the, the child. Naomi is a mother like the congregation, nurtures the young members as a mother nurtures her, nurses her child. Verse 17, and the neighboring woman gave him a name saying, this son born to Naomi and they called his name Obed. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David. So Obed, o, Obed, what does it mean? It means one serving or one working, right? So that's the name of this child, that the blessing that comes from this beautiful union of the bride and the bridegroom is one who is serving, one who works. The bride of Yeshua are workers bearing fruit for the bridegroom. Go to Matthew 25 and verse 13. Matthew 25 and verse 13. Therefore, be alert, for you do not know the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man comes. And while here we are, we're in the time when it could be any time, and this is what makes it even more exciting, because nobody knows it. For it is like a man who went on a journey. He called his servants and delivered his possessions to them. And the one indeed he gave five talents, to another two and another one, each according to his ability. Right? So Yahweh doesn't give us more than we can handle. And he immediately... And he went immediately on his journey. And going, the one who received the five talents worked with them and made another five talents. In the same way, the one with the two also did. He also gained another two. But going the way, the one who received the one dug in the earth and hid his master's silver. And after much time, the master of those slaves came and took account with them, right? The return of Yeshua. And coming up, the one who received five talents brought another five talents near, saying, Master, you delivered five talents to me. Behold, I gained another five talents above them. And his master said to him, Well done, good and faithful slave. You were faithful over a few things. I will set you over many. Enter into the joy of your master. So we are rewarded for the fruit we bear. And everybody knows the parable, the one who didn't bear fruit wound up not being there. The lily hat was taken away because the, it's indicative of the Holy Spirit being with us, which Shavuot is all about. So we're rewarded for the fruit we bear. Last scripture, Ruth 4 in verse 21. Ruth 4 
in verse 21. <clears throat> and what is the end result of this? And Solomon fathered Boaz, and Boaz fathered Obed, and Obed fathered Jesse, and Jesse fathered David, King David. So, wow. So, we see here that uh, Obed literally becomes the grandfather of David. So, this child that Ruth and Boaz has is David's grandfather, and Ruth and, and, and Boaz is his great-grandparents, his great-grandparents. And of course, we know that the Messiah is also born through this line. So it shows us that, uh, just again, the beautifulness of this story and the fact sometimes you see par parables in Scripture. And parables are great stories. They tell, they tell something. But this is a true story. These are real people. You know, Naomi is a real person who went through much sorrow in her life, but then the joy that came after by trusting in, 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 in the kinsman redeemer. We see the same with Ruth, you know, that think about it as a young woman who lost her husband in her mind, she's probably thinking if she's going to stay with Naomi, she would never be married again. She'll never have children, but you never see that in the story. You never see her side of what she's feeling inside because her whole thing is love and loyalty and serving and serving. And that's what we're supposed to get from this story. So, and in the end result, these are the real great grandparents of King David. And we know King David is the one who winds up being the lineage for Messiah. So the story of Ruth, who is one of the greatest women in scripture, right? And I say this when you talk about judicial order. She never preached a sermon. She never was, you know, the leader over a congregation. Like, like the way people think today, they all want to do something that is being seen of other people. You know, in giving a sermon and, and writing a book, whatever it could be, I don't know. But to be seen. And yet, how, did, how is Ruth being seen? She's being seen through serving. She's being seen in what she's doing as a servant. And that's the way all of us should be. We should be looking at how we're serving others, not how others are being able to see us in the limelight. So Ruth is one of the greatest women of Scripture, like I said, never preaching a sermon, never being an elder or anything like that. But why is, she, is, is, is her example so important? Because out of almost anybody you'll see in the Bible, she shows humility and loyalty for all of us to learn from. You can't probably find, you know, you might find one or two examples there of, of loyalty like Jonathan and, and, and David, but this is above the top stories that you'll see for love and loyalty in Scripture. Ruth, which means friend, that's what her name means, and it comes from the same root of the word for shepherd, Ra'a, is a beautiful story of a humble, selfless person who loved her mother-in-law and was grafted in to the tribe of Judah and was loyal and faithful in all her house. She never thought of herself or what was best for her, but was faithful in all things. And in doing so, Yahweh blessed her with the bridegroom, her kinsman redeemer. She was also blessed to be the great grandmother of King David, and she is a pillar in the genealogy of Yeshua Messiah. Now, technically, in a legal genealogy, a woman cannot be in that legal genealogy. So, but in Matthew, that's not a legal genealogy of Yeshua, but it's actually the genealogy of Joseph the father. We see Ruth's name in that genealogy. So she is a pillar in the genealogy of Yeshua, being the great grandmother of King David. She set us a great example of how a believer should be in not trying to save our own life, but losing our life. For Yeshua, our bridegroom, and for the work in his kingdom. So, one more day till tomorrow. We'll see everybody tomorrow on Shabbat. Praying for Yahweh's spirit to come. Yahweh bless. Shabbat Shalom.